Hello and welcome to the second episode of the MAPS Canada Expert Edition webinar series, The Ethnobotany of Psychoactive Plants. My name is Michael Oliver and I will be your host for this series. After two successful seasons of examining the psychedelic renaissance, MAPS Canada has decided to start a mini parallel series with some of our experts. Each expert edition will feature a previous guest from past seasons in a four episode mini series. This series is open to anyone, and we hope that you might feel inclined to share it with your friends if you enjoy today's episode. We do encourage donations if you're in a position to give, and your support does go a long way in helping us to work towards the legalization of psychedelics. MAPS Canada is a nonprofit charity that relies entirely on public donations to help us achieve our mission of expanding safe access of psychedelic med medicines for all Canadians. To learn more about MAPS Canada, you can visit our website at www.mapscanada.org. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you are new to Crowdcast, there's a few things to note about the platform. So first of all, on the right, you can see the chat where you can discuss things with fellow audience members. And then if you draw your attention down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a tab that says, ask a question. So this is where you can actually ask a question directly to Chris anytime throughout today's episode. And you also can go in and look at other people's questions and upvote them. So towards the end of the episode, when we do a Q&A session, we're going to be focusing on the questions that have the most upvotes. So if you see a question that interests you, uh, make sure to hit the upvote button there. Uh, episodes of this series will be recorded and available to watch again right here in Crowdcast. So if you miss today's episode or any of the other episodes in the series, you can still follow the invite link back to view the replay. And um, the replays are found on the, the same page here that you're on right now. So if you have any questions regarding Crowdcast itself or the webinar as a whole, feel free to reach out to our webinar team at webinar at mapscanada.org. For this series, we are joined by special guest Chris Killam. Chris Killam is a medicine hunter, explorer, lifelong yogi, psychedelic advocate, and media personality. He has investigated medicinal plants among indigenous people globally for decades, from Siberia to the Amazon and to the Congo. Chris is the author of 15 books, including the international bestseller, The Five Tibetans, Ayahuasca Te Test Pilots Handbook, and The Lotus and the Bud, Cannabis, Consciousness, and Yoga Practice. Chris has appeared on over 2,000 radio and 500 TV programs, and the New York Times calls Chris part David Attenborough, part Indiana Jones. Each episode of this series will be focusing on a different plant medicine, with today's episode spotlighting kava. Drawing upon more than 30 journeys into the Amazon and experiences with dozens of Amazonian shamans, it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Killam to the expert edition stage. Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be on today, and I want to express my great gratitude to MAPS Canada for hosting this series and for you for hosting this series, Michael. I really appreciate it very much. Um, I have been working... Uh, as an ethnobotanist conducting field research and helping to establish sustainable trade in various botanicals of different kinds for about 27 years now. I was doing that somewhat part-time before then, but I've been doing it full-time since then. And the plant uh, that really helped to launch my career, the plant that uh, gave me a huge boost and, and a wonderful start to this particular chapter of my life was kava. In uh, 1979, I was at a dinner party in uh, Boston, and uh, it was all herbalists. You know, we all have our various herbal remedies. And a friend handed me a chopstick with this blob of black goo at the end of it. And he said, try this. And I said, well, what in the world is this? What's it going to do? He said, it's kava. And I put this blob of black goo in my mouth. And in about two minutes, I had this very tranquil, euphoric feeling. And I said, is this stuff legal? And he said, yes, it is. And it would be 16 years uh, before I would go in 1995 to Vanuatu, South Pacific, where I would uh, be one of the people that helped to start what we know today as the international kava trade. What I'd like to do today is tell you about kava, tell you a little bit about Vanuatu, South Pacific, which is the epicenter of kava culture in the world, even though kava is spread out across the Pacific Islands, and also tell you how a Polynesian tradition of firewalking migrated to Melanesia, where Vanuatu is, and became something special there. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, let's see, share this screen. And Michael, did you say do entire screen on this? 
Yep, you'll want to share the entire screen. Okay. So, all right, share. And then, are we up to speed now? Everybody got a, um, the full, okay. The full slide on, on the screen. Is that the yeah. way it should be? Yeah, it's okay. Looking perfect. So what I'd like to do first off is, is start off by dedicating this to my many hundreds of friends in Vanuatu, South Pacific. I have been phenomenally beautifully greeted there, shown great hospitality. I was made a chief there. I was their diplomatic representative to the U.S. for three years. I have had some of the most exhilarating and marvelous experiences of my life in Vanuatu, and I really do owe it all to the people there whose kindness and generosity have been unfailing for 26 years. Uh, Vanuatu, is a name that means land eternal. Vanuatu is an archipelago of about 100 islands with a population of not quite 300,000 people. Um, it is in Melanesia. So as you look at the Pacific Ocean uh, and all of the various lands across from it, on the east, you have Polynesia. In the middle, you have Melanesia. And on the west, you have Micronesia. And the people are different uh, and different looking and um, have different customs depending on what part of Oceania you're in. So this is Melanesia, um, a tremendously beautiful place, Vanuatu. Um, as you can see, this coastline, there's lots of beach, and you can go miles and miles on beaches and not see a soul there. It, it really is an actual tropical paradise in many respects, and uh, still re retains spectacular natural beauty. This is not a special interior scene. This is just kind of a typical interior scene in Vanuatu. Lush vegetation, a tremendous amount of pure water flowing. What, what's interesting about Vanuatu is that it is a calcareous plateau. So it's actually calcium that has risen up uh, tens of thousands of feet from the ocean floor. And uh, water goes up through that and comes out of splits in the top tops of hills and becomes pure, clean, beautiful drinking water. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of fresh water in Vanuatu, which owes to the lushness of the place. Our uh, botanical object of desire here tonight is kava, uh, Piper methysticum. Kava, as you can see, is a uh, bushy green plant. Uh, it has these classic sort of piper heart-shaped leaves. It is the root of the plant that is used and the lateral roots that come off of this main root stock um, as a beverage that people drink typically in the afternoons. And they do this across all of Oceania. Um, kava drinking customs differ greatly. But kava is a central artifact of Pacific Island cultures, and it is very, very highly revered. So here you have a few kava bushes. You go into any village, any place in Vanuatu, you're going to see tens or hundreds or thousands or even perhaps tens of thousands of kava bushes, depending on their land size. When I first got to uh, Vanuatu, South Pacific in 1995, I met many people who are friends to this day. The man on the left, Michel Bouleman, is a chief in my home village of Londar. The man on the right, Ari'ipaya Salmon, uh, was one of my closest friends in life. He's been dead for a number of years now, but they're both holding lateral roots. And this is a really special root bundle if you were going to go to the wedding of some important people, if you were going to go to a, a very important gathering, you might bring something like this as a gift and it would be spectacularly well received. Uh, this is obviously mature kava. It's going to be rich in the compounds that make kava relaxing. And those are the kava lactones. And I'll talk more about those a bit later. Uh, Vanuatu is the origin of kava in the Pacific. And there are about 72 different varieties of kava in Vanuatu. And they differ according to how they look. So their morphology, uh, their size, their color, and also the ratio of kava lactones. Uh, kava lactones are resinous steroidal lactone compounds. 
Um, there are about 17 that we know of, and of those, six are primary. And the ratio among them is what determines whether a kava is a pleasant drinking kava or a nasty kava, something you don't want, or something really lovely. This particular variety that Michelle is in right now in this picture is Borugu kava. Borugu kava is considered a noble kava. The noble kavas are the best drinking kavas. Uh, they have an absolutely immediate effect, and I mean they relax you as it's going down your throat. Um, lasts for several hours, feels really good, doesn't give you a headache or nausea at all. So the noble kavas are preferable for drinking and also for trade. Uh, here is another good shot of Borugu kava, the most popular of all the noble drinking kavas in Vanuatu, South Pacific. So this is the plant uh, that is our object of interest tonight. I want to show you a little bit about the people in Vanuatu. This is not a staged shot. Um, there are two different types of villages and communities. There are villages and communities that are sort of trying to keep up with modern times to the best that they can, can given that these are islands of people who only until recently lived very much like they did for many hundreds of years ago. Uh, there are still some traditional villages. These young girls are in one that's called Panbanglap, a village I've spent some time in. And so they'll dress traditionally. Uh, they'll be raised traditionally. If they choose to go off and be more modernized, it's not a problem. But some villages are hanging on to the old ways and the old ways of dressing. So this is kind of a hanging out in the village square, if you will, of Pan Banglap. Um, it's very warm there. You don't need a lot of clothing. Um, you don't really have to wear a shirt if you don't want to. Vanuatu is typically warm all the time. Uh, the young boys of, of Pan Banglap, uh, very curious. Uh, you know, the kids anywhere are wonderful to get to know, but the children in Vanuatu are just unusually happy. Um, I've watched three, four kids play with a stick and coconut for hours and just be completely content. Uh, there's very strong community in these villages and people take care of everybody's kids. If a kid falls down and needs to be picked up, you don't have to wait for the parents. In Vanuatu, in the course of working with Kava, as I have since 1995, it's been my great good fortune to make friends with a lot of people, including village chiefs. Uh, the man that I have my arm around, Chief Jean-Paul, was the chief of Bay Martelli. Uh, Bay Martelli factors heavily into this evening's talk because it's due to the fact that Bay Martelli was wiped out by a tidal wave that we ever started firewalking in Vanuatu in the first place. Uh, chief Jean-Paul was a paramount chief, so in other words, a chief of chiefs. And he's here with two other chiefs of Bay Martelli. Uh, after Bay Martelli was wiped out, they moved up a hill and named the village Londar. Um, but these are three of my chief friends, although I'm sad to say that Chief Jean-Paul died in a diving accident a few years ago. Um, the women of Vanuatu are among the hardest working women I've ever seen or met in my life. Uh, if they're not peeling taro and yams or killing the chicken or doing something or raising the kids, uh, they're always involved in something uh, phenomenally friendly, uh, warm, hospitable, lovely people. It, it really is the case that the culture of Vanuatu is an extraordinarily friendly one. Um, the last time that uh, my wife Zoe and I went to Londar, went to Vanuatu together, they did what any of us would do for a guest that was coming to stay for a few days. They built us a house. So, so this house here that you see, this is our house for basically a week. Um, they built it for us so that we'd be comfortable, so that we would have our privacy. And it really is... Um, kind of in, in keeping with the nature of the people of the Vanuatu, that they would do something like this for a guest. Uh, it's actually the second time that I've had a house built for me there, uh, but a really, really lovely thing. And I'm sure that somebody else has long lived in it since we were there, but it was just an incredibly sweet thing to do. Ari Ipaya, who I showed you before, uh, and I became very fast friends. We traveled all over the United States and 
uh, really did a lot of work over the course of 10 years promoting kava and helping to take it from something that was just largely drunk in villages in Vanuatu to something that's in the supplement market globally. Uh, there are a lot of kava bars now in Florida and Hawaii and other places. And we were fortunate to be very, very early in this. So we used to get together and plot and scheme a lot and figure out, you know, what, what are the things we can do uh, to really push kava and to help to make it more successful in the global market. So now what I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a visual tour to Pentecost Island. Pentecost is one of many islands in Vanuatu. It's about 60 kilometers long, about 18, 20 kilometers wide. It has vicious tides going up and down the sides of it because it's a north-south island. Um, and I've gone there by boat, which is just absurdly difficult. And I've also gone there by small plane, which is much more convenient. So here we are coming into uh, Pentecost. If you can look on the an image on the left through the dashboard or the, the screen, the windscreen rather, you'll see there's a little strip in the middle of uh, the grass there. That's what we land on. That is Londar, what they call their airport, what we call a landing strip. Um, on Pentecost Island, and I was there exactly a year ago, right before COVID-19 shut everything down, I was there with a uh, kava trader named Michael Luzet, and we went around with a connection of his, Kasi Bebe and his sons, to see what was happening in the kava scene on Pentecost Island, which is also where Bay Martelli was and where my village of Londar remains to this day. Um, on uh, the eastern side of Pentecost, I, I want to say it, it, the kava trade is not easy. Um, growing kava is difficult. Tending it is difficult. Harvesting it, cleaning it is really hard. Transporting it is tough. These islands have terrible, terrible tides, uh, and you have to use boats to get around the islands. The entire eastern side of Pentecost Island has no roads whatsoever. So you're either walking a footpath with sacks of kava on your back or you're getting around by boat. Uh, Kasi keeps a, a small storage place for kava there because kava has become something that has been a tremendous economic boon to the people of Vanuatu. It has helped them to raise their standard of living, to feed their families better, to clothe themselves better, to get many of the amenities that we take for granted. Kava in general is drunk in a nakamal, and a nakamal is a special kind of typically, typically dimly lit uh, building, long and low, bamboo, palm roof hut, and it will also be used for meetings. So very often, uh, if I show up in a village, uh, we'll wind up in a nakamal having a meeting. Everybody will come into the nakamal. We'll all sit around and talk. It's a set-aside place for kava and also for special, special meetings. Um, when I first started going to Vanuatu in 1995, very few people had boats with outboard motors. You'd see one or two here. Thanks to the kava trade, people have a lot more. And while I'm not a uh, big petroleum fan, it does mean having uh, outboard motors that people can get around. Uh, most of us have cars or we use transportation of some kind. For the people who live in the Pacific Islands like this, getting around by boat, you're either getting around by boat or you're hiking. Uh, in the photo on the left, I'm with Michael Luzet, the, tra the trader with whom I traveled. The villages of uh, the islands of Vanuatu are simple places. The housing is simple. On the right, you can see the kitchen, um, uh, basically a kitchen uh, in this village. Uh, this one run by uh, Kasi's wife, Margaret. Um, on the left, you see one of Kasi's sons carrying a, um, a big root of kava. And that big root of kava will be cleaned for the kava drinking that happens faithfully every evening. It's kind of a joke. You know, you'll be out in the fields, you'll be working with taro or yams or maybe cutting some wood or something. It's around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon and somebody will say, hey, what time is it? And there's this pause and everybody goes, it's kava time, man. And they just literally stop in mid-machete stroke and walk away. 
And then begins the, today, the day's kava making, which is labor intensive and takes hours. Um, at the very same time that kava is something important for kinship and community, it's also the case that it is uh, a very valuable agent of trade. So here you see these simple greenhouses that have been erected with rebar and plastic. Um, in 1996 or seven, I think I was in Bay Martelli and um, I was talking with one of the chiefs there and he said, it's really too bad that we can't uh, dry more kava you know if we had what we needed we could dry tons and i immediately thought big buildings solar panels um temperature controls <laughs> you know, whatever and i said what do you need and he said we need chicken wire <laughs> and i said you mean like chicken wire chicken wire he said yeah so of course when i went back to the capital island i bought like eight ten rolls of chicken wire and had it sent to the village and then they were able to dry tons of kava um one of the things that I've found all over the world, whether it's in Vanuatu or Syria or uh, Siberia or Congo, you name it, is that very often what's needed for trade to make it work can be very, very inexpensive. Yeah, you can spend many, many tens of thousands of dollars on a solar dryer if you want, but I bet you this one cost about 200. Um, so these have sprung up all over the islands helping people to dry more kava for the international kava trade. So here uh, you've got uh, Kasi's sons on the left cleaning Borugu kava for drinking later. And if you can see closely on the right, um, they skin the kava roots with a bush knife and they scrape it clean. You don't want any grit in your kava. You don't want any dirt. Uh, you don't want the skin of it, the peels. You want a nice, clean drinking kava. Um, in uh, the village of Longfis, uh, Michael Luze and I, uh, according to the people there, were the first non-natives to ever drink in their Nakamals. Uh, here on the left, you see a basic setup, a couple of guys um, with the materials for making kava. And on the right-hand side, you have one guy making kava. As I said earlier, kava drinking customs are different depending on the societies in which you go. For example, in Samoa, the traditional custom is that women will take kava root, chew it, it's very, very tough and fibrous, until it is soft and all mashed up, and then spit it into a bowl. And they will do this over and over and over again, and then add water, mix it, mix it, mix it, strain it, and then that's what gets served as kava to men and women. Um, in Vanuatu, South Pacific, kava is always only ever drunk fresh uh you take the roots you you pull them fresh you peel them you clean them you pound them you make kava you drink it on the spot uh in fiji and other parts of oceana uh they drink kava dry so they dry the roots they grind and powder them they mix them with water and drink it that way that's why people who've been to fiji say yeah you know i drank like 12 13 14 cups of this stuff and then finally i started to feel it uh dried kava generally is fairly weak um fresh kava can be tremendously strong and I, I said you can actually feel it relaxing you as it goes down your throat uh in vanuatu in the village nakamals um the men drink there and the women drink elsewhere in the urban areas uh the capital island um and in the small towns around Vanuatu, men and women together go to kava bars and sit around and share kava with each other. So it really depends on whether you're in a village or in a kava bar. Um, so this is kind of a moody scene. This is island kava drinking, uh, drinking Borugu kava at night. Um, the whole thing about drinking kava is really wonderful and moody and admittedly mysterious. Um, by the time you're done making the kava to drink, it's nighttime, and you sit around in these dimly lit places, and um, kava makes your hearing very acute, so people tend to speak rather quietly with each other. There's no loud talking, and you hang out, and you talk, and you share about your day. Um, 
Kava really is about kinship and community, but it's also about something else. Kava can be used for dispute resolution. Um, I've wronged you in some way. We go sit down, we prepare kava, we drink kava, we talk a little bit. Then we get to the heart of the matter. I say, look, I was in the wrong. I owe you two chickens. Um, we agree on that. It's done. The conflict is over. It's not something that you carry forward. Um, here you have a close up of these two guys making kava. And the guy on the right has a piece of coral in his hand. And he is making what's known as stone kava, holding a bunch of root in one hand and grinding and mashing at it uh, with the other hand, with the coral, mincing it so that it becomes very, very finely ground. Then that is mixed with water and that is drunk. Um, on this last particular trip uh, over a year ago now, or exactly just a year ago, um, we went to a village of Laluk. Laluk is on the eastern coast of Pentecost Island. Uh, they have an immense amount of kava growing there. It's, it's just a huge gr kava growing area. So you have on the left uh, the chief of Laluk and Kasi Bebe, um, the person we traveled around with. And on the right, uh, you can see us walking through these very, very large, beautiful, mature plants. Uh, kava plants need about five years to grow, uh, better if they get seven, although what researchers have found is that the kava, the kava lactone concentration of three-year-old roots is very, very good. Um, so there are people harvesting three-year-old roots. You get less weight, but you still get a good, strong kava. So here again, a solar dryer on the left and on the right, some of us just kind of hanging out in front of the Nakamal. Um, in general, I have found most of the people in Vanuatu very proud to have their photo taken. Um, one time back in the late 90s, I was in uh, Pan Banglop, the village I first showed you some pictures with, and the chief said, please take a lot of photos of us. And I said, why? And he said, we want people to know we're here. Um, it's very, very far away, Vanuatu, very far away. You get there either by Australia or by New Zealand or by New Caledonia, but no matter where you go, it takes a good long time to get there. And here, you just meet people along the way. Um, some folks that I met just in the course of, of walking the island uh, right outside of La Luke. So this is harvesting kava. Uh, kava grows up um, the way I showed you before, these beautiful green bushes. You cut the stalks uh, away from the plant and you actually save the stalks and replant them. So when you have a kava plant that let's say has 30, 40, 50 stalks, you harvest a plant, you plant 30, 40, 50 other plants. So it's kind of an exponential growth growth situation. You have to dig this root out of the ground. It does not go easily. After you've done that, you have to clean it. Fortunately, there's a lot of fresh water in Vanuatu, as I said. So these guys are sitting in and by a stream, washing the roots, scraping off the dirt, and then with their bush knives, peeling off uh, the skin so they have nice, clean kava. Here again, like the picture I showed you in Lawn Fist with uh, Kase Baby's sons cleaning the kava, uh, here is the clean, peeled, washed kava. This would be ready either to dry or to make kava with in the evening. Once you have your clean kava, the preparation just starts. Um, these guys here, especially the one in the gray shirt who is laughing with his head thrown back, who has a pole in his hand, he is pounding kava root that is in, um, basically in a pipe, in a large pipe. And he's using this heavy wooden pole to smash the kava root, to break it up so that you can then much more easily make the drink kava with it. 
Um, here's a man, <laughs> I, I like to call him Mr. Cool. Um, I never did learn his name, but he was always around. He was always doing hard work. He always had this great look on his face. And here he is taking kava that has been thoroughly pounded and he's mixing it and mixing it and mixing it with his hands, making sure that he's really scooshing it all around to get as great a concentration of the kava lactones into the liquid as possible. Um, kava can be made by a bunch of different methods. In Vanuatu, they use kava boards. So they take the kava root and they uh, squeeze it. They mash it around like that guy was doing in the bowl. Eventually, it all gets strained through a coconut fiber. Um, people will drink in the villages. They'll drink uh, kava in coconut shells. That's how you drink. You drink a shell of kava. Kava. And in the kava bars, I noticed that while they all used to use coconut shells, now most of them have switched to ceramic bowls of different sizes. Um, here you have somebody, you, you get to see pretty clearly those round mounds on that board in front of this guy. That is spent kava. Those are balls of kava root that have already been thoroughly squeezed out, and somebody has drunk the kava from that. Uh, here's a very good close-up shot of hand mashing. So you take this mashed up kava root, you add a little bit of water to it, you work it and work it and work it and just keep working it. You squeeze those kava lactones out of the spaces between the fibers of the root and eventually you add a little bit more water, you strain that, you drink it. Here's a close-up again uh, of straining the kava through fiber. Typically, the kava will get strained two, maybe even three times. So it'll have no particles of root left in it. Um, it'll just be pure liquid kava. And here you have somebody drinking kava. And if it looks like he is grimacing, he is. Um, kava is not as bad tasting as ayahuasca. There's no question about it. But kava doesn't taste great. And kava is one of those things that the more you drink, the, <laughs> the less good it tastes. Um, I'm somewhat of a kava lightweight. When I'm in these villages, when I'm in these uh, places, I'll drink two, maybe three shells of kava. So I've had four before. I've had five before. But usually after a couple of shells of kava, I'm fine. Uh, the native people that I hang out with will often drink kava way into the night. And what you do is uh, people get called up by rank. A uh, chief will always drink first or an honored guest will drink first. Uh, and there's this natural order of calling people up, have a shell of kava. Five minutes later, you'll be asked if you want another. About 20, 25 minutes later, you'll be asked if you want another, and it goes like that. If you were to drink your three shells of kava back to back, like drink one, then another, then another, you'd probably throw up on the spot. But if you space them out, 20, 25 minutes or so, no problem at all. So the rotation serves a couple of functions. One, it keeps a social order. And number two, it also keeps people from getting nauseous. Uh, here in Londar, um, when a group of us showed up on a special occasion, um, they got out about, about eight or 10 kava boards and just went to town making kava. We drank for hours and hours after this. Um, usually it's the younger men who make kava. There are a couple of guys here though that I've known for a long time who sat in because they just plain like to do it. But usually you turn the function of making kava over to the younger guys and let them do it. So now I want to get on to the story of firewalking and how this strange practice came to Vanuatu, South Pacific. I mentioned earlier that I'd had two different houses built for me, one uh, in Londar when my wife Zoe and I went to visit a bunch of years ago, nine years ago now, and uh, one on Santo Island. This is right beside Paya's house overlooking the great Pacific Ocean. Um, they just felt that I needed a place on, on by, of my own. So it was a little two-story place, nice sleeping space up top where you could look out at the 
the ocean and just watch the you know watch the sunset um a beautiful act of generosity that my friends did for me making sure i had a comfortable place when i visited there my friend paya uh who i showed before is polynesian his name is Ari'i Paya. He's dead now, but an Ari'i is a chief of chiefs. It's a great chief. Uh, his great-grandfather was the king of Tahiti. And while Paya had neither a kingdom nor money, he was a prince. And uh, um, as such, he, had spe he enjoyed special privileges. He pretty much could go anywhere in the South Pacific, and he did for years, show up in places, and people would look at him and the tattoos that ran from his belly all the way to his ankles and the nature of those tattoos, and they'd just go, oh, a great chief has shown up in our midst. Um, in 1999, uh, at night on the southern end of Pentecost Island in Bay Martelli, which was sort of my home village at the time, um, all the people in the village, but four very elderly people, had gone way up on the top of a hill for a wedding. And they were up there, and they watched in horror as the bay drained out. When a bay drains out, it means a tsunami is coming in. A tsunami came in three times. It completely wiped out the village. The only thing that was left standing was a little cement church. All of people's homes were swept away. All of their property was swept away. All of their possessions swept away. They were left with nothing but their lives. And the four elderly people who remained in the village that night died, and we can only hope they died quick deaths. Paya called me up and said, um, we have to do something about this. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, we need to hold a fire walk. And I was in Massachusetts. He was in Vanuatu. That sounded like a perfectly good idea to me at the time. I said, okay. He said, we can charge people admission to come to the fire walk. We can raise money. We can help rebuild the village. I said, great. Paya was one of only two Tahua. That is one of only two traditionally trained Polynesian firewalkers from Tahiti left. Uh, there was another guy. I never met that other guy. He remained in Tahiti. But Paya had been trained and taught how to make a fire. And the firewalk and kava goes like this. That a long time ago in Tahiti, the people were suffering a famine. The goddess Hinanui came to them and said, I will show you what to eat and what to drink if you will perform this act for me. And they said, what is this act? And she said, it's walking on fire. And they kind of thought about, thought about it and said, well, you know, maybe better than starving. So she taught them how to make these fire pits. And what I'm going to show you now is the making of a traditional fire pit. What you're looking at right here is a pit that had been used the year before. Uh, about 35 feet long, about 14 feet wide, and the stones that you see all around it play heavily in the firewalk. Um, you start out by making a pit that's this deep, so it's about a meter deep or so, and then you collect many, many tons, or many tons, four, five, six tons of dried coconut husks. Dried coconut husks burn very well, and so they go at the bottom of the pit. Uh, you want fire to burn from bottom to top. And so the coconut husk are the first things we go out and collect to get started on making the fire pit. Making a fire pit and putting together um, a fire walk, uh, it can be done in 10 days, I guess, but it really takes about two weeks. It takes a lot of people. It's an enormous labor, a uh, huge community of people required to really pull this off. Um, you need to cut down about 12 or so giant sea pines, cut them up. Uh, we put about 50 or so, 50 to 60 tons of split and cut wood into the fire pit on top of the coconut husks. And if you can see, uh, 
about a third of the way from the left-hand side of the uh, picture, there's a bamboo pole sticking straight up out of these out of the wood. There's another one um, that that actually you can't see. Uh, those two are important for starting the fire when that happens the day of the fire walk. So, so here we are putting more and more and more wood into this to make sure that we have a good roaring fire for the fire walk. Um, Putting these events together is an enormous labor, typically involving a bunch of trucks, at least a couple dozen guys, at least a couple dozen women, people willing to donate uh, oxen and pigs for food and tons of yams and taro and a uh, ton or more of coconuts and at least a couple of tons of kava. Uh, it's just this massive, massive undertaking. So here you have typical village cutting of meat. Um, the whole idea of the uh, fire walk is that when the people performed this, basically this way of honoring the goddess of Hinanui, they were rewarded with food and beverage to drink. The food was meat and taro and yams and island greens, and the beverage to drink was kava. So here you have some women preparing, uh, I think we had about two yam, uh, two, excuse me, two yams, about two tons of yams and taro at this particular fire walk. Uh, so, you know, cleaning and peeling yams and taro for days. Uh, there were guys who I saw from sunup to sundown just um, grating coconut, just shredding coconut like mad, just hundreds and hundreds of pounds of it all day long. Again, a tremendous labor. Um, so here are some of the oxen and pigs uh, being butchered. Uh, all of the cooking for uh, the firewalks is done in a pit. The pit cooking is ingenious. It results in remarkably tasty, beautifully flavorful food. Um, these women were our core cooking team for several years. I, I was fortunate to firewalk in Vanuatu with my friends and with the chiefs and with the kava growers uh, six different times, six different years. And these women were really our core cooking team. If they had to cook food for a thousand people, which they did actually, um, it was no problem for them. They just plain knew how to do it. They were phenomenally cheerful and wonderful and great to be around. Um, all the food gets wrapped up in banana leaves before it gets put in the ground. So here they have a lot of uh, yams and taro. They'd also take grated coconut and put it all over that and then put salt on that. And when it comes out uh, cooked, um, the coconut is basically like a butter, a salty butter. It's beautiful the way they cook. So here you have um, banana leaves that are being filled with meat, taro, and island greens. Uh, this will then be covered, uh, as you can see here, uh, covered with more banana leaves, and then covered with fabric, and then covered with soil. So there'll be a great big mound of soil. And there are hot, hot, hot rocks uh, at the bottom of this little pit, this cooking pit. Um, there was a fire, fire in there to start. The stones get red hot. You put lots of banana leaves down on the stones. Then you put the food down on that. Then you cover it all. And then you let it sit all day long. And in the evening, when you uncover it, you have magnificently flavorful, savory, beautiful food. The day of the fire walk, we typically get up around five, get ourselves out to the pit um, and light the fire. And uh, as you can see, uh, what I have in front of me here is the traditional ancient jerry can of kerosene. Um, you know, you know, we use modern methods. <laughs> Why not? Uh, basically, where the uh, bamboo pole is, you pour kerosene down there. It reaches down into the coconut husks and down through the wood. Then you take sticks, you set them on fire, and you put them down in there, and you start to get the kerosene going. So here's a bunch of us getting the fire going, getting it started. Um, we've got flames going, coming up beside one of the two bamboo poles. Uh, we'll have flames coming up beside both of them. So this is probably 10 of six in the morning at this point. Um, Paya on the morning of the fire walk would always go out onto the stones 
uh, as the fire was starting to get going underneath and he would prepare himself ceremonially, uh, just kind of get himself in the mood for the day. It really is a special day when you do a fire walk in the evening. Now, it was the first time that I uh, went to walk that uh, after the fire got going, <laughs> I started to realize that we were really in for something here. What you can't see here is the heat. You also can't see that many of the stones just explode into flaming red hot shards and go shooting off in all directions. So there's a perimeter around the fire pit that you don't go into during the day because it's dangerous, because the rocks really do explode, because a rock can throw a missile through your head and there's just no purpose in that. Um, but it was really when this fire pit started to get going that I thought, gee, you know, this could be pretty intense, actually. This could be downright scary. The evening of the fire walk um, starts out, uh, those who lead the fire walk are dressed in outy leaf robes, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, in this fire walk, about a thousand people showed up. We charged them three dollars a piece. They were going to get a feast afterwards. Uh, those who wish to walk the width of the fire after we walk the length of the fire uh, were allowed to do so. But the very first thing is to invoke the goddess Hinanui. Uh, in this instance, uh, Paya's daughter Pueta, who was trained by his wife Nicole does a traditional Polynesian dance to the goddess Hinanui um, for the purposes uh, for purpose of propitiating the goddess and making sure that the fire will be safe for the people who walk. Um, and even though the people of Vanuatu have absolutely no connection whatsoever to the pantheon of gods and spirits of uh, Polynesia, they were immediately turned on by the idea of the firewalk and by the idea that it was uh, an important thing to do for Kava. Uh, so they took it up tremendously quickly. So here, uh, Pueta really starts to open up the ceremony with a dance, dancing all around the fire. The second part is pounding the stones. Six of us took huge bamboo poles and we got around the perimeter of the firewalk and we beat the stones as hard as we could. The reason for this is so that people will not fall into fire holes when they walk the pit. If you fire, fall into a fire hole, you'll certainly be crippled, but you could die. Um, we have had people badly burned in fires. This is fire after all. These rocks get hot enough that you can flash fry steaks on them. want to be perfectly clear, this is not a walk on the beach. This is not a backyard empowerment workshop. This is full-on Pacific Island firewalking. So you beat these things down, and by this time, I'm pounding the stones down going, this is a spectacularly bad idea. There's no part of me that want to walk, wants to walk across fire. It's blazing, brutally hot. You can barely stand to be near it. Uh, but it gave me a sense of what's to come. The very first person to go into the fire, the person who had to go into the fire, of course, was Paya. He's the Tahua. He opens the fire. He shows it can be done. Um, I can't tell you how it works. I mean, if you did put a piece of steak on a, on a stone, it would cook right away. I can't tell you why you don't die in the pit. I have absolutely no idea. I've walked to these fires probably a total of 30 times uh, over six different ceremonies. I can't tell you how it works. I can tell you that you don't necessarily need to be in a special Zen state of mind because I've always been scared. Um, when I was first ready to fire walk, uh, I got to the back of the line of all these native guys. I figure I want 24 guys to walk ahead of me before I get up there. And Kami, who's the guy in the red wrap uh, here in this uh, in the back, in the back, the black guy with the, the red wrap, 
came running up to me and said, no, man, you're special. Come here. And the next thing I knew, I was the third guy in line. And <laughs> I was really very, very unhappy about that. I just have to say. Um, but what we do when we open the fire is we walk the length of the fire. It is brutally hot. It is excruciating. You can't imagine just how horrifically hot it is. Uh, you don't have light. The stones are uneven. There are fire holes between them. You can't walk fast. You can't walk slow. As soon as you step into the pit, your mind goes blank. All you know is you're breathing and walking. Um, Kami, um, one of the sturdiest, most remarkable human beings I've ever met in my life, one of the most dependable people I've ever had the good fortune to be around, walking the pit, showing everybody this can be done. This crazy act, this absurd act, walking through fire can be done. We're doing this for Kava. After we do that for a while, we allow guests to walk the width. Interestingly enough, the ones who want to do it the most and the ones who run around and do it as many times as they can before the fire is closed are the little kids. Little kids will walk right across the fire three, four, five, ten times if you let them. They just love it. We've had the prime minister of Vanuatu there a couple of times. Uh, one time we had one of the prime ministers, big, proud chief, this enormous guy. And Paya looked at him and said, you're going to walk? Well, <laughs> there were like 800 people walking the, watching this guy. And he kind of gave Pi a look, stood up, took off his shoes, took off his socks, rolled up his pants, walked across the fire. People went wild. People loved it. Those of us who have had the good fortune to fire walk and to have this connection with Kava and this connection with the spirits uh, who are honored in the Pacific, who you know are related to Kava, have had the experience of a lifetime. I have to say, uh, when I firewalked the six different times that I did, every time I would go to bed at night seeing the fire for about a month, I would see this lit up blazing thing. I'd see the stones. I'd see the fire holes between them. Sometimes I would have the feeling of actually, oh, I don't know what happened here. It just went. I'm going to go back. Um, I just have the feeling of actually walking on the fire. Um, oh, come on, for Christ's sake. Skip, 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 skip. Um, I do want to tell you the last thing about this, though. This particular evening, this particular firewalk was our very last. Um, and when I was at Paya's house, which is next door to the field where the fire pit was, um, we were getting our outie leaf robes put on us. We also were uh, completely covered with tamanu and coconut oils from head to toe. I have no idea why that's part of the tradition. I really don't. But we were like greased weasels. I mean, we were <laughs> really oily, okay? Um, but as we left Paya's house to go out onto this uh, dirt road and then down it a ways and then into the field where the firewalk was, as we set off, and, and mind you, we'd had no kava, we'd, have not, we'd had nothing psychoactive, all of a sudden, the entire space around us became this kind of hall of warriors and gods. Uh, and I saw them as clearly as I saw the trees, these giant heads of these Polynesian gods. Interestingly, it wasn't Melanesian faces. It was Polynesian faces. And they were huge, gigantic size, one after another after another on both sides as we were walking out Paya's driveway to the street at night. And I remember walking and looking at these and having my outie leaf stock on my shoulder. And all of a sudden I went, oh, right. This is the last one. This is the last time. This will never happen again. And it never did. 
I have a book, Kava Hunt, Medicine Hunting in Paradise. I'd, of course, encourage you to read it. Um, it tells a lot more about kava. And uh, if you're a member of the American Botanical Council, you can also read the uh, thing that was published about 10 months ago or something, The Rising and Falling Fortunes of Vanuatu Kava in Herbalgram, which recounts my um, last time in Vanuatu, South Pacific. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my story and listening to a little bit about Kava. And um, I'd like to come back to you folks. And um, let's see. Uh, oh, no, no, get rid of this. All right. And get back to you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. That was amazing. That's an entirely different world. Wow. It is, it is a different world. And... Um, just spectacular. I mean, I, I, you know, I feel so privileged to be there every single time and I've been treated so beautifully there. I, you know, sometimes I just cry. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I can imagine. And when was the last time that you were there? One year ago. One year ago. Yeah. That must be yeah. Uh, it, a little upsetting not to be able to travel as, as much these days. Uh, as much. My travel is going, <laughs> my travel is going to the farm store. <laughs> it's ridiculous you know i mean i'm an yeah. explorer i was i don't i haven't i haven't even visually seen an airport with my eyes in a year yeah same here well i'm stoked for the next time that you're able to go there hopefully it'll be sooner than later hopefully so we have some uh, wonderful questions here that have been asked by our viewers um so i'm just going to start those off all right uh, starting with the first one the most popular question from patricia uh howell uh, she's asked, I have read that long-term daily use of kava is supposed to cause side effects, yet you are suggesting that in Oceania it is drunk daily. Could you explain? Sure. In Oceania, I mean, in Vanuatu, they drink copious, copious quantities of kava every single day uh, for their adult lives, starting from the time they're in their teens. Um, the only thing that can happen is what's called kava-induced dermopathy, where you might start to get some whitening of the skin. Now, keep in mind that these Melanesian people are very black-skinned people, but they'll get some patchy whiteness on the skin, and that's um, due to an excess intake of kava lactones. If you back off that for a week or two, it goes away. Um, there is no known harm associated with kava-induced dermopathy. Um, there was a completely incorrect um, story, basically, that came out over 20 years ago that kava caused liver damage. Teams of medical doctor inv doctors investigated that whole report, and it turned out to be completely bogus. Unfortunately, there are still many good, intelligent people out there who believe that somehow kava can cause liver damage. If you're drinking kava root and you're not drinking something from the above ground parts of the plant, which the native people do not do, there is no problem with the liver. So yes, they drink it all their lives. They drink it every single day. They don't, they wouldn't choose not to because it's something that brings people together. You know, you go, you sit, have kava with your friends. When I'm in Port Vila in the capital, uh, on, on the capital island of Afati, I go with friends to any one of five or 10 kava bars that we like. We sit around, we have a few shells of kava, we talk, we share our day. You go to a traditional village and you go into the Nakamal, you sit around, <laughs> you have a few shells of kava, you talk about your day. Um, it, it's just a matter of, of bringing people together. It's very beautiful that way. Mm, that's amazing. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I think that's important for, for people to understand. Uh, the next question we have here is from, uh, I hope you're pronouncing your name right, Maya Merchant. Um, her question is, is there a website that has generally up-to-date list of kava cafes or farms that can be visited around the world? Well, well, I know that kavaworld.com has a lot of good information and has a lot of information about the kava bars of Vanuatu, but I think it also has information about other kava bars that aren't in Vanuatu. I know there are many in Hawaii. I know that there are kava bars in Florida. Oddly, there are some in New York. 
uh, certainly some in California. I'm not sure if there's a directory other than Kava World that uh, lists them all. Okay, thanks for sharing that. I noticed that also uh, one of our audience members, Jimmy, has also suggested that potentially comwithkava.com can also be a list for, for folks in the US. So people can check okay. that out and we'll share the other link too in the chat. Um, awesome. So the next question is from Selena, who asks, what does uh, what do you think about tinctures of kava available in the U.S., such as Herb Farm, Gaia, et cetera? I think they do a very good job of getting you about as close to the kava experience as you can get when you're not actually drinking kava. Um, I have great regard for uh, Herb Farm and Gaia. They both do a terrific job. Um, fluid extracts of kava are going to be more uh, readily absorbed and you're going to feel them better than let's say uh, taking capsules of kava extract. So um, I, I like them. Um, when we started out, you know, as I've said, I established trade. I mean, I'm not like a trust fund kid running around doing anthropological research just for the kicks of it. I, you know, I work on establishing trade around the world. And, um, you know, when we first started introducing kava at trade shows, we did it as uh, a concentrated extract. And um, at trade shows, it would be typical and common for us to give out three, three and a half thousand samples. Uh, mm -hmm. And we all made sure there was enough extract and, and because it's alcohol based not enough alcohol to get you high, but enough to keep it from going bad and, and to tease the cavalactones out of the roots. Um, you know, we found, I mean, I always made sure that we gave out a lot of extract so that people would have a real concentrated feeling. Um, you know, the kava experience, when you drink fresh kava root, uh, you know, as it's going down your throat, once it gets to about here, this wave, of relaxation starts to go through the body and by the time it's down in your stomach <clears throat> it's just expanded it's hard to get that experience with any of the extracts but the extracts that you mentioned do get you the closest okay that's good to know thanks for that chris i was wondering if you could just speak a moment to the the contrast uh, that you mentioned er quite a bit in your presentation just about when you started um, you know, exploring this medicine in Vanuatu and now, and you mentioned that it's really been a really big economic boon for the peoples there. Could you speak a little bit more to that now and like maybe how that's, yes. uh, how that's developed even till this point in time? Yeah. When I, when I went to Vanuatu for the first time, um, there was no kava trade. There was a Chinese man who was selling some kava to New Caledonia and that was pretty much it. Um, yeah. and the, and all the rest of the kava, uh, trade was internal in other words people making a uh, growing kava maybe selling it was uh something that the vanuatu government wanted to see as a you know a real product uh they kind of didn't know how to do it though actually and it took demand uh, from the outside to kind of help to build that up. When I first started going there, kava growers were getting eh, three, four dollars a kilo for kava, which is uh, an awful little money for so much work. Now they get more than twenty-five dollars a kilo. Uh, most of the kava growers have boats with outboard engines. Um, the uh, villages are in better condition. The clothing is better uh the schools are better they have more access to medicine uh you know telecommunications that kind of thing so so what you know one of the challenges that those of us who are not um indigenous native people one of the challenges we face is ridding ourselves of the uh, of the old idea that really has been given to us by the media that somehow you know the the native people wherever they are should remain you know keep the old ways that's not our decision it just isn't our decision um it's up to people to decide how they want to change 
Maybe they don't want to paddle furiously against 12 foot waves and impossibly difficult, dangerous, potentially lethal seas. Maybe they want an outboard motor. Um, you know, they all have mobile phones now. That's different. That's very different. Um, there's a lot of solar lighting. That's phenomenal. Uh, kerosene lamps are the number one cause of house fires in the world and the number one cause of burns in homes in the world. So replacing those with solar lights, that's been a plus too. The capital island of uh, Efati, way more crowded than it ever was. Lots of traffic. That really sucks, actually. Um, so as life has changed since 1995, much of it has gotten better for the kava growers but as is the case with all growth in all places, you know, the benefits are uneven. Okay, that's that's good to know. Yeah, I feel like that's an important nuance to, to introduce there. So thanks for that. And I mm -hmm. think there's a, maybe a similar conversation happening with like indigenous plant medicine use as well and the different kind of rituals around that and yeah. what's being ported over. Um, I'm going to jump over to some of the other questions we have here. We have a, a question from Julia Harris who asks, how can uh, Canadians have access to kava? Uh, kava is still not legal in Canada, which is like sand not being legal in Hawaii. It just makes no sense. I don't get it. I mean, just to order it, just order it, order it on Amazon. <laughs> Have it shipped to your house. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. What else can I say? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, the next question is from Mike Allen, who says, do you have or know a list of vetted healing retreats? I know nothing is guaranteed, but recommendations could be greatly appreciated. Healing retreats in, in Vanuatu? Yeah, the question doesn't really specify, but I'd assume that it'd be healing retreats that utilize kava. So maybe the a first question no. is, do you know of any healing retreats in general that do that, that have that No, I, I don't. I don't. Okay. I mean, you know, in, in Vanuatu, like if you're in the islands, unless you got some sort of busy schedule, I got news for you. It is a healing <laughs> retreat you know you eat fruit during the day you go to the beach you take some walks you drink kava in the evening you have some dinner with your friends i mean it's not like it's you know a brutal schedule okay uh, i mean even doing work there it's just plain relaxing mm -hmm. um except for when you're out in a small boat in high seas and you think you're gonna die and that isn't really relaxing at all but um or or fire walking that's not relaxing but otherwise, um, you know, I know of no healing retreats there. I mean, there are certainly plenty of uh, resorts in Vanuatu on the capital island and, and on the big island of Santo. Um, you know, in terms of other places all around the world, I mean, as you know, there are thousands of, of good places. It depends on whether you're looking for healing diet or you're looking for ayahuasca. So it's somewhat of an impossible question to answer. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, no worries. I'm thinking I'm realizing now the, qu the question maybe was around ayahuasca um, instead. But I'm going to move mm -hmm. on just because the focus is around kava today. And the, uh, the next question from Selena is just getting at this idea of um, tourists in Vanuatu. And the question is around, you know, would people in Vanuatu welcome first timers uh, there? Well, Vanuatu has a brisk uh, tourism industry. Uh, People in Vanuatu are very welcoming. Um, most of the islands have places to stay. Some of them are very, very rustic and so kind of magical. I mean, I stayed at a place on Tana. Uh, Tana has a live volcano that you can go up and look down in the rim of, and it's just hideously scary to do that and stupid because people die on the rim all the time. But um, you know, I stayed in a place that was moody and mysterious. They could have been built 400 years ago. That's kind of mm -hmm. how it was. Um, so you can stay at a posh resort in Vanuatu, or you can stay in a really rustic places. But yeah, people are very welcome. Uh, you know, the, the for the most part, the same rules apply almost everywhere in the world. Be respectful. Pay attention. Uh, don't use all the common hand gestures that you use here. You know, mm. not a good idea, not a good idea, not a good <laughs> idea. You know, you have to like know what you're doing out there. Um, but, but yes, they welcome, they welcome people for sure. And, um, you know, 
when you're respectful, when you're interested. And, and, and here's the key with the work I do. I'm interested in people's plants. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually interested in the plants that are of great importance and value when you show up interested in the plants they don't seem to be able to do enough for and with you so um i think a lot of it is showing up re with respect but certainly you'd be very welcome in vanuatu mm. that's great thank you for that chris next question is from matthew davis he says i can't help but notice certain parallels between the way kava is used in oceana and the way we use substances like alcohol in the west like for meetings, as a social drug, to relax after a long, hard day, etc. In a phrase, it seems far more recreational than something like ayahuasca or psilocybin. I wonder if you could speak to the value of such substances to the individual and to society. Well, okay. The difference, the difference between kava and alcohol is that um, alcohol can kill you. Mm. Kava won't. Uh, alcohol's the neuroconcept, um, alcohol, you're smashed unless you're an alcoholic. Um, you drink a few shells of kava, you've got all your wits about you. So I don't disagree with the timing uh, is, is similar. It certainly is, you know, people getting together in the afternoon or evening. Um, but the effect is very different, and the effect makes all the difference in the world. Um, you get together with some people, you know, uh, E.M. Lemaire, who was an anthropologist, said a wonderful thing. He said, one cannot hate with kava in them. Kava is an agent of peace. Alcohol, as we know, is often an agent of violence. Um, mm -hmm. I heard Snoop Dogg say a wonderful thing uh, recently. I mean, it was kind of scary, actually, but he said, he said, you take two a uh, hundred brothers who don't even like each other, put them in a big room with a bunch of ganja. In in an hour, they're going to be taking selfies with each other. You take three brothers, put them in a room with a bottle of alcohol. One of them's going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's extreme, but I think that it really is the case that where we see tremendous abuse, deaths, traffic deaths, uh, domestic violence, and so many different things uh, brought about by alcohol use, and I'm not suggesting that there aren't many people who use alcohol safely because mm -hmm. there certainly are um but the effect is just wholly different kava right. really is about kinship and community right yeah and i guess with that effect you really get the different varieties of intentions and i feel like with kava and also all these other plant medicines it's saturated with that cultural context of intention whereas here in the west we don't really most people i think don't really use alcohol with intention is, but it's also to, to fairly answer the question that was asked it's not a psychedelic mm -hmm. okay you're not going to have visions on kava um you know you're not going to have those massive <clears throat> fully immersive healings that people have with psilocybin or with ayahuasca or with iboga uh or, you know with the mushrooms that's not it that's not what it does um, but many people uh, in Vanuatu will then reflect on the ancestors after they've drank. They'll go, they'll go in, they'll try to make some sort of connection with those who've gone before. So there is uh, very often, not always, not often, I mean, very often it is just social, okay? You sit around, you drink kava. But also, there can be solemn occasions. There can be special occasions. They all get punctuated with kava drinking. When uh, Pope John Paul showed up in Fiji, very first thing, he was served kava. It's like, okay, you're going to show up here. You're going to drink kava. Um, and, and so uh, it, it's not intended to fulfill the same function as something like ayahuasca or magic mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's important to know. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, so the next comment slash question is from Haley Yates. She says, shame it's so hard to meet the Australian. Oh, I'm not hearing you well. Oh, can you hear me better now? Can you hear me okay? You're, you, you were breaking up there. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I think you broke up a sec for a second there too. Can um, you hear me okay, okay now? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry about that. Yep, we're we're good. No, no. 
Okay, awesome. The machines are not our friends. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, they're not. Maybe one day. Maybe by the, maybe by the fourth episode, we'll finally befriend them. <laughs> um, so yeah, Haley had a question slash comment. Shame it's so hard to meet the Australian TGA requirements for kava in a supplement. Very strict requirements here. Is there any supply issues to wild kava due to increased use and popularity as a supplement, or does it tend to be cultivated for supply? Okay, wild kava doesn't have a nice effect. So you don't drink wild kava, period. Um, cultivated kava is drunk because you can have varieties that are what I call good drinking kavas. In other words, they come on quickly. They last a few, few hours. They give you a lovely sense of tranquility. They don't give you a headache or make you nauseous. Um, the Australian health authorities have long, long been just completely out to lunch when it comes to kava um, and the reason has to do with um, grave aboriginal abuse of kava and that sort of gets held up as the national standard for why they don't want kava to be legal which is absolutely insane I mean you know the problem that we see with Aboriginal people in Australia is that many of them face very, very grave, harsh conditions in society. A lot of people kill themselves petrol sniffing. Um, so the Australian health authorities are just completely out to lunch with this. And, you know, all, all the science on the safety is there, all the science on huge populations of people drinking kava every day of their lives and coming to no harm is there. Um, so whatever is going on in Australia remains an absolute mystery to me. Okay. Thank you, Chris. The next question is uh, that I'm going to ask is from Jade. If, if, and it's kind of a response to a comment you made earlier regarding alcohol and kava. If kava doesn't induce any liver, sorry, where did it go? If kava doesn't induce liver damage, is it a healthier alternative to alcohol? Are there limitations to scaling up the kava industry? Would this be a good thing? One of the differences between kava and many alcoholic beverages is that many alcoholic beverages taste good and kava never does. Hmm. Kava's never going to replace booze, <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it tastes nasty. And you can't make kava taste good. You can add other stuff to it so that you have bad tasting kava plus other stuff, okay? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> And also scaling it up so that it could replace alcohol. No, that's not really possible. That's not, you're talking, you know, many tens of millions of tons of kava would be required. No. I mean, the way it works now, um, the kava industry is good. It certainly could be better in terms of the volume, but it would actually be a disaster um, for the peace and tranquility of the people of the Pacific Islands, if all of a sudden kava were in demand a thousand times more than it is now, it would utterly destroy their lives, um, ruin their lifestyle, change the peace and tranquility of their societies, and create conditions that we don't want to see happen to nice people. Mm, totally. So you would say that probably right around now, the demand for kava is at a pretty sustainable level? It's at a very good level. I mean, of course, we've had terrible problems because of COVID-19. Um, you know, everything's been messed up. Um, you know, there's no tourism in Vanuatu. The kava bars aren't doing much business. Kava trade is down. Um, but pre-COVID and certainly post-COVID, I think we can expect a really robust kava market. But I would never hope for it to get as big as alcohol. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. So we're approaching the end here, but I think we've got time for at least a couple more questions. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try and pick one that maybe you haven't really touched on too much yet. Uh, so Haley asked another question around tourism and I suppose kind of advice for folks that might wanna actually make a trip to Vanuatu themselves. Um, and so her question is, as a uh, naturopath and a herbalist, I'm very keen to travel to these beautiful locations to learn more and experience the traditional use of kava. Could you suggest a way that Westerners would be able to go to Vanuatu and experience more of this rather than a standard Vanuatu holiday, if such a thing exists? Well, yeah, sure. Go to Vanuatu, 
spend a couple of days on the Capitol Island, then go to Santo Island, which is a bigger island, but a little bit more the Wild West, and then leap off to a place like Pentecost or Tana. Um, you'll want to be with somebody who speaks Bishalama, which is the national language, uh, which is a pidgin. Um, but yeah, you can look, you can get out there. I mean, people do it all the time. Uh, Lonely Planet Guide is pretty good, um, you know, for, for Vanuatu. It's, it's a very handy guide. But I would say, yeah, go to the island of Tana. Um, there, you, you know, at night you go along on the lonely country roads and you look in the forest for uh, a burning kerosene lamp. You see a kerosene lamp lit. That means there's kava here. You go there. You drink kava in some moody little shack in the middle of a forest on Tana Island, you know, while you see the sky lit up by a live volcano. That's as good as it gets. That's as good as it gets. Sounds pretty amazing. Uh, we have a question from Lorraine. Would you use kava along with psilocybin at the same time? Interestingly enough, a friend of mine just sent me a psilocybin kava extract um uh fluid extract and frankly i don't really care for the mix of the flavors myself um right. you could you could you know kava will relax you um the psilocybin of course will make you trip depending on how much you have um there wouldn't be really any reason there wouldn't be any uh reason in terms of health that you wouldn't do that um you know, in a way, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, yes. Is The straight answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, I remember when I um, did a uh, an ayahuasca ceremony on the Kona Coast in Hawaii a couple of years ago. And I was with a, a friend who was uh, dying of cancer. And so we were on the smoke cannabis all day long diet uh, for his pain and... <laughs> You know, for my, I was with him. <laughs> and um, we smoked prior to ayahuasca ceremony and we smoked right after. And it was actually quite lovely and there was no contradiction there and it worked very nicely. And and we aren't the people who originated that. I mean, in Santo you know, um, um, there wouldn't be try those together. Okay, thanks for sharing that, Chris. I think I lost you for a second here. Can you hear me? I was thinking I'm doing one last question we got here from Ted. If you have a moment, but I think I just lost you for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing you, Michael. Okay, I am hearing you, but I'm not seeing you. Um, did your video? Okay. No, actually, my video is fine. I haven't seen, I'm, I'm looking at an icon of you. Okay, funny. So our, our screens are flipped. Well, I'm just going to continue with the question. I think others might be able to see both of us. Uh, so we got a question from Ted Stodgell. Oh, who God, says, "This is terrible." Sorry. Hopefully you can. Hopefully you can hear me. This is the last question, and then we can wrap things up. Uh, Chris, what's your favorite cultivar? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But you never. I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah. Um, Borigu. Borigu is the most popular of the kava in Vanuatu. I've drunk many, many cultivars of kava, and um, I like Borugu the best. Uh, it's a good feeling kava, uh, very nice, comes on in seconds, lasts for a couple hours. So that's what I prefer. And more and more growers have switched to growing Borugu um, because of the effect and, and because it, it seems to be uh, much in demand by purchasers in the international market as well. And a lot of that increased demand um, for Borogu specifically has to do with the extent to which my, my friends and I <laughs> have promoted it all these years. Um, so yeah, Borogu is my favorite. Okay, thanks for sharing that. That question was from Ted Stodgill, who's also been very helpful in the comments um, that we've had here. So Wonderful. thanks, Ted, for your help there. And Chris, thank you so much for uh, answering that question and all the other questions that you're able to get to today. There's definitely some more here, uh, but maybe we can save those for another time as we're, we've run out of our time for today. But 
it was awesome to hear those stories that you shared of uh, both Kava and firewalking. It was incredible. So thank you so much. Well, my great pleasure. And I, I want to thank everybody who's here this evening. I mean, I know you have many things you can do. I appreciate you spending your time uh, with me and with us in this special map series. And uh, next week will be uh, coca leaf and uh, how the shamans in the Andes use coca for divination. So hopefully you'll uh, tune back in for that. Michael, thank you very much. Really appreciate you hosting this tonight. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. So to close off the session today, I would love to thank Chris again for joining us to launch this series and for sharing his incredible stories around Kava and firewalking. I'd also love to share a big thanks to the wonderful volunteers that make up Maps Canada. There are lots of moving parts behind the scenes and it takes a team to make something like this happen. Maps Canada is going through a transition at the moment in more ways than one, and it has been amazing to see everyone step up and contribute their dedication and passion to this shared cause. As you might know, and as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, uh, research is very expensive and the psychedelic renaissance is built on a foundation of solid research into psychedelics. To continue the momentum and build a strong case for psychedelic use, more research does need to be done, and so we appreciate any and all donations that are made as these go directly to funding this important research. So that is it for today's episode. Make sure you tune in next week for our second, or sorry, our third expert edition episode where Chris will be discussing coca, shamans, and the divination in the Andes. Thank you to everyone for attending, and we will see you on the next episode.